So, Mr. Malas, I must say, uh, for a long time I've been looking forward to your lecture. Uh, it's really an honor and a pleasure that you're here. Uh, for those of you who don't know Mr. Malas, he is the president of the Employers Group for the Economic and Social Committee of the EU. Uh, I know this is a very difficult week for you. Uh, we were going back and forth with the scheduling for this lecture for a while and uh, agreed already a few weeks ago, 2.30. Uh, so I'm pleased that it did in fact work out and nothing came in between. I'd like to say a few words of introduction about Mr. Malas, and then uh, as you see the agenda today, we've asked each of the speakers to speak for around, let's say, 15, maximum 20 minutes if possible. Uh, then we'll have discussion, and I think we should be able to catch up for the delay uh, by the end of the day. Uh, Mr. Malas, uh, ladies and gentlemen, graduated from the Institut des Etudes Politiques, uh, Sciences Po, where I also had the chance to study for a year, uh, in Paris, uh, in 1976. He then received a master's degree in Central and Oriental Europe in 1979. He served as co-president of the EU-Bulgaria Committee, director of the Assembly of the French Chamber of Commerce and Industry, vice president of the European Association of Small and Medium Entrepreneurs Union, and a lecturer at Robert Schumann University in Strasbourg and the University of Warsaw in Poland. Just a few of his achievements include the creation and launch of the European Network for Euro Info Centers, the creation of the French Permanent Circle of Delegates, the creation of the Public Policies in Europe Master's Program at Robert Schumann University, and the creation of the French Chambers of Commerce and Industry delegation to the European Union. He currently serves as president of the Employers Group of the Economic and Social Committee of the European Union. His lecture topic today is European Identity, Myths and Perspectives. Please join me in a very, very warm welcome for Mr. Henri Malos. Thank you. Lord, same, same thing, same thing. First of all, um, hello and good afternoon, and, and forget about all what uh, Mark said about all the uh, degrees and uh, careers. It's not important. Um, I don't consider my engagement in European affairs as a career. I hate the word career. And as your young people, I would like to encourage you to hate this word of career. I think in life it's important to have engagement, to have passions, and this is the most important. Career, it's, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of Jean Monnet. Jean Monnet, some of you maybe know, was one of the founders of the European Union, and he wrote in his uh, memories that in life you have to choose or you have to promote your career or you have to promote your ideas. So my point is to promote my ideas, the, the ideas of European Union, of European integra integration, and not my career, and I think career is not important. I think when, at the end of the day, at the end of, of your life, it is important what you have achieved. It's not how, how many degrees you got in university or how many degrees. Forgot. Uh, so important is I'm, my passion is Europe, and I am try to work as honestly, as decently for the European integration. This, this has been my engagement since I'm not small, but quite a young man, 12, 13 years old, started this passion. And uh, I still have a passion. It's quite not so easy today. We have two days to be passionate, enthusiast for, for, for European Union during these days. Not so easy, but we have to do that. Uh, I have a honor, I consider that as a honor, not as a career or as an achievement, to be member of the European Economic and Social Committee. I'm one of my colleagues here, uh, Mr. Mr. Stoe from, from Bulgaria is as well, my colleague. We are all members. Uh, some of my colleagues uh, elect me as president of one of a group, we have three groups, but I am a colleague, I'm a member like all the others. Uh, European Economic and Social Committee, just a few words, uh, I will not bother you with uh, details about, uh, you know, in Europe, European Union we have a lot of institutions, but I, I'm always pleased, pleased to, to repeat, forget also about the institution, it's not important. Just uh, remember, mind you, that uh, 60 years ago, Europe was destroyed. Europe was looking like, uh, I don't know, Damas, Baghdad, or, or Kabul. Uh, our cities were destroyed because of the stupid civil war we had in Europe for hundreds of years. And this institution where you are there, parliament, uh, commission, councils, is nothing. Forgot about the people with nice tie and with, uh, it's not just take, forget. Just think that this is what we have developed, what we have promoted to ensure peace 
uh, and wealth in our, in, our, in, our, in our poor European continent who has been devastated during, during decades and during hundreds of years. So European Economic and Social Committee is one of European institutions. Uh, this is the unique place where you, you can't find, uh, as for the members, you will find no technocrats. We have some technocrats to help us. We have probably too much, too many. We try to reduce the, the number because they are. And we have, but we, the members, we have people coming from the real life, like you, you and me. That means uh, one third we are employers, entrepreneurs. So I'm entrepreneur. I'm, as I say, work with a, with a, chem, with a French Chamber of Commerce. I had and I have again now uh, my, my company. One third of our other colleagues are workers. They are engaged in trade unions, and some of them are still workers. Uh, and the third part is uh, people from the civil society, NGOs, fighting for, for better, better sustainable development, fighting for women's rights, fighting for consumers' rights, and so on and so on. So we have a unique uh, institution, the European Union body, uh, where you find no politician, no uh, people from the administration, nothing against them, but it's different. We have the only institution composed by people from the civil society. We came every day, every week, from their country. Mr. Stoif is coming every week when he's coming. From, uh, from Bulgaria, I'm coming from, from Paris, so it's much easier for me than for him. Uh, and we are here dedicate our time, we are not paid, dedicate our time for the European integration because we consider Europe as, a, as our passion. Uh, and so it's the reason why I start to say that it's not a career, it's a, it's a passion and it's an, an engagement. So the question of European identity, meet and perspective. <clears throat> to be brief, I will say that uh, European identity, an identity, you can have a lot of kind of definition and all of them could be the right one. My personal definition, don't say that it's the right one, so it's my is that uh, to have an identity is to be proud of. Uh, I have two identities. I have three identities. Uh, first of all, I'm French, can probably understand from my accent. Uh, but uh, I am, first of all, I'm Corsican. Coming from Corsica, probably where, is, where is some of you maybe not know, but it's, a, it's the most beautiful island of, uh, that we have in, in the world. So you have, you have a chance to visit. And I'm very proud of because we have beautiful sea, beautiful mountains, beautiful beach, beautiful culture, beautiful song, beautiful music. Uh, and this is my identity, because I'm proud of. Of course, I know that some, we, we don't have just a nice thing in Corsica. We have, we have the highest uh, uh, criminal, criminality rate of Europe, so this I'm not proud of. But this is the reality, but I'm proud, proud of other things. I'm French. This is my citizenship, so I've been, it's my education, it's my culture. I'm proud of, not proud of everything, but I feel it, my identity. And my third identity for me is to be European. And I feel European, I try to learn various languages of Europe, because the first step to feel it, to be, to be European is to speak some of European languages for, for respect for the other people, to understand at least. Uh, and I feel at home in all European countries. I feel at home in Bulgaria, I even have a home there, but, uh, uh, and, and I like all the European countries. Of course, the other two, but my preference is, uh, is European, it's nothing against the others. Uh, and this is this European identity. And this European identity today, as I say, is, I don't know if it's a myth, but it's, uh, it's something that we miss today, is that the feeling of, of, of European society to be proud of. Um, there is, uh, when you see pools in the various countries, and I saw last pool concerning France, you see there is a growing gap between the engagement uh, of the population in favor of European idea and uh, concerning the European institution, there is more and more doubts about the way European Union is conducted. And I think we can't, we can't, really, we can't really understand, understand it because the uh, European Union is uh, focusing on details, uh, the size of a carrot and the size of a light of, of a tractor, and not focus on what's important, 
the question of youth, uh, youth unemployment, the question of education, the question of industrialization, the question of global trade and so on. And this is why uh, this thinks today that we have a gap between European support of European idea and lack of support to the European institution. Of course, we, uh, we are not happy at all about that, mainly in our small European Economic uh, and Social Committee. So the question is that if you want to go further, if you want to, uh, and, and we want it, to, to attract again the confidence of the people, mainly the young people in the European Union, because I'm, my, my political engagement for Europe came from my childhood, where we suffered, and I remember my, my parents, grandparents suffered from the war, suffer, suffered from the destruction that we had. Uh, and my first step to the European Union identity was the German-French reconciliation. All this movement, when I was 12, 13, 14 years, I was sent by my parents to German family and understood why we should now be friends to the Germans and no more, no more enemies. And this had built my European identity uh, as it builds my European identity when I was 20, when I crossed the Iron Curtain and I would say, how unfair and how stupid this was, this division of Europe in two blocks. The thing that the people from the East couldn't travel, people from Bulgaria, they have to, to wait uh, months, if they had, were lucky, to get a passport to pass the border. How unfair it was. And this, I feel, as, as a young person, as something when you are, I think, as human beings, you always fight against things that are not fair. So this European identity today for the young people is, is difficult because they don't have, they don't uh, experiment the war. So peace, uh, freedom of movement that we enjoy today with Schengen, for example, uh, Schengen visa, f visa free or control free system in the European Union seems to be natural. So we have to find new way to create an identity. Of course, we could be proud of uh, Europe, of what we achieved in the last 60 years. We achieved peace, stability, European Union is still the biggest economic power in the world. If you add all the GDP of all the European, all the members of the European Union, uh, we have a higher GDP than the US. US is just number two. But you know, the, you know the, the crisis of confidence, the gap of confidence between citizens and the European, in, European institution growing, all this make the people uh, fear and make the people doubt. So my... Uh, I will, I will finish by that. Uh, our engagement and my engagement uh, as actual president of one of the group and I hope president of the European Economic and Social Committee in the next uh, year or months is to build on a European identity on concrete projects. We have the most successful concrete project we have achieved in the last 20 years was the Erasmus program, this exchange of students. And we have to build on that to create movement. Yesterday in our committee, we, we gave our civil society prize, we gave that each year, to an association of Erasmus students. We were privileged students, we got uh, money from the European Union to study in another country of the European Union, but some of them, they dedicate their time to promote the culture of a country, to promote European values, to help disabled uh, young people, to help uh, less privileged young people, and to act as, as I say, responsible citizens. So we have to build on that, and we have to develop much more mobility, much more exchange of young people, ec develop mobility. We have to build, we are working on a project on European identity for companies to make the, that, the, that the European company should be proud of being European, should be more ethical, and be more ethical abroad. We are working on a chart of ethics for European company acting in in third country, I'm very proud that, that, that for example, in, in our committee, one of our colleagues make an opinion on the uh, fight against sex, sex tourism, sexual tourism, you know, this ugly thing that, that, that unfortunately mainly made by, uh, abuse by, by European people traveling abroad just uh, for, to abuse uh, child. And we should make that ethical, for example, that some company traveling agency uh, uh, air transport uh, agency will engage themselves to fight against this, uh, this disease and this, and this abuse. 
so we want the European to be proud and to be ethical and to come with a European flag. We work uh, together for, for a program with young entrepreneurs who want to develop a European company statute. Uh, I'm working on a project on European tourism to make common values and, and common goals for European tourism, to make the European discover their own territory of Europe. For example, uh, very few French people know how attractive is Bulgaria as a, as, as a, tourist, as a tourist country. So we want to work on very concrete projects that at the end of the day, the European citizens could feel proud to be European and to add to their regional identity, national identity, the European identity. And then we'll start from that to build what is my goal, that means the United States of Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think many of us share your optimism for the United States of Europe, but uh, no, it was really, I think, a very insightful uh, lecture. Questions and comments, please. Who would like to go first? Uh, hello, my name is Maisa. Uh, I wanted to ask you regarding the immigrants coming to Europe. What are the plans to make them feel that they are European? You know, there's many immigrants are from Arab countries, from Africa, from anywhere in the world. Even yesterday, we met someone from Cuba living here. How do you make them feel European if they live here all their lives and their kids will be living here as well? Yes, to be, to be frank to you, uh, I would say that uh, I feel ashamed these last years when I saw the treatment we was uh, given by the authorities, including the authority of my country, to migrants. Uh, you remember what happens in Libya in the, in the, in the last months. Uh, where my country was quite, was quite engaged as well, as you know. And, and you see the treatment, for example, the, the Libyan refugees got normally, not all the time, but normally, a quite warm welcome by, by the Tunisian. Although the Tunisia is not a very rich country, although Tunisia suffered as well for, for political turnout. And when you saw what happens to the Libyan refugees arriving in Lampedusa or some, or some or some other place, I feel, I feel really, as, as a citizen, as a citizen, ashamed. Of course, you can understand that uh, uh, we have rules, that uh, we should, um, on, on one way, we cannot just uh, let everybody arriving here. But I think that when someone arrives here, he should be treated hum with, human, with humanity. And what uh, makes me ashamed, it was this lack of humanity. This is just for refugees arriving. Then coming for people who want to come to, uh, to the European Union. We are working in our committee very much on this, on this question of, uh, of integration. And I think for that, we have to build on, this is, this is linked to with the European identity, to a certain model of integration. Uh, if you see what happens in the last 20 years in all of our countries, you can see that uh, there are different models of how you integrate migrants in your, in your society. And we have two extreme models. We had two extreme models, and the two failed. Uh, first, who failed was the French one. So I prefer to start with my own model. French model is a model where you say everybody should, okay, uh, you should see everybody should just speak pure French and uh, no uh, cultural difference, uh, we are one nation and uh, uh, not, not any uh, separation between the various kind of people, no ghetto. And then you have a British model, and you saw this summer, last summer, that felt again, with felt too, where there was this, this communitarism. Its community keeps its own rules, old tradition, religion, and so on, and uh, separate lives. And I think this, this is wrong too. So we have to find, and I think this is a very interesting topic. It's not my uh, topic of expertise, but I think it's very to, to find a way where when people come and go get uh, okay, permission to stay and uh, so start to learn the language, start to work, start to get all the, all the documents, start to work, they should, uh, they should really, uh, on, on one hand, be able to keep some of the tradition. On the other hand, have some respect of common rules. And this is all the debate we had uh, in, in our country concerning, uh, concerning religions and how you, how, you, how you behave. 
but we have to build a certain model of tolerance on one way, another way of respect, respect, including respect of a tradition and of a, of a law of a people, of a country where you stay. But uh, personally, for example, I, I am, I feel ashamed also when, when I see that in France uh, we have, uh, we, we create problems for students coming from abroad, may, maybe coming from, uh, from, from new region, from Africa or from, or from Asia, from Middle East or from North Africa, making all their studies in France and then they are not allowed to stay to find, to find a job. Uh, even if it's, it's so stupid because we are lacking, we're lacking, uh, we're missing nurse, we're missing doctors, so, so, so we need, we need, we need also migrants. So we would like to see the, the policy, uh, the European policy of, mig of migration be more visible, more, uh, with more humanity, more open, more open mainly for, not just, but mainly for people uh, with uh, a good capacity, because we need good capacity. We, as you know, in Europe, uh, a very bad demographic uh, situation. So could be my answer to your question. Thank you for your question. Thank you very much. There's a second question here in the middle, please. My question would be um, concerning the civil society and the NGOs, and the, namely the funding. Mm. Um, I know that in some countries, most of the money comes from governments, and that doesn't allow some uh, NGOs to move freely and uh, draft projects if they're not within the interest of the government. Uh, but that's not the case everywhere. And I'd like to know um, if you are fostering um, funding for certain projects with um, the civil society and NGOs, first of all. And then I'd like to ask you also, when it regards to private sector and perhaps uh, cor corporate responsibility, if you are looking into ways to integrate the both and uh, namely, let's say, afterwards utilize those funding into projects that could go through the civil society. Um, and then if, in your opinion, um, there's a way that we can finally unite the three of them, namely governments or politicians, um, civil society and the private sector instead of clashing, but since we cannot deny they're um, connected one to the other, to try to find a way ultimately, and if you see that mm -hmm. it's, you know, it might take time to develop, but if you foresee um, a way to do so. Thank you. First of all, we are not funding. We don't have uh, our committees. We just give opinions with a political body, but we are not funding. Funding comes from the European Commission. So each, each institution has its own task. But we can, of course, support some projects. Uh, and I think that in the, in the, we have the, the main European NGOs uh, are active in our committee. We, we help them. We give them some premises. We have quite nice premises close from here. So they are at home in our, in our, in our building. So we make all efforts to make, for example, when they need to meet, they can meet. We, uh, we have to provide them interpreters, translation when they need to support their project. Um, we try, of course, to, to support the concept of corporate social responsibility. It's one of my responsibilities, I can say, as president of employers group. Uh, I'm very engaged. Today we have a funny, but we have a, uh, the, the European Commission made a, a paper document on corporate social responsibility. So we have, we decide, I had, I negotiated the last two days with my two colleagues. We have three groups, workers group, trade union, and civil society group to see who will be the rapporteur for, because we have to give an opinion on that. So it will be a colleague from our group, employers group, because I consider that it's our responsibility, responsibility of the employers to work on on corporate social responsibility. We have, of course, our way, our vision. Our vision is that corporate social responsibility uh, should, should remain a volunteer, a volunteer approach, not to, be, not to be obligatory. There's always a tendency of the European Union on every topic to have a regulation. So we, as employer, we don't want regulation, but we want to support all the, all the companies who are engaged in um, corporate social responsibility, in social matters, sustainable development, and other, not just uh, because it's, 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 a, it's a business opportunity as well, you know, in, in a lot of sectors, corporate social responsibility promote the, the image of a company. Uh, but uh, as, as I told you, we, are, we work on this chart of ethics for, for European companies, mainly for the activity abroad, 
to show to the, to, to the customers and to the country where, where the European invests that we have some rules, we have some ethics, and of course a corporate social responsibility is a way to show. For example, I, I mentioned this, uh, this work we made on fight against, uh, against sexual abuse uh, for, against, against the children, to protect the children. And I think we work, for example, with, uh, with Air France Group uh, to support some of their projects because they make projects, uh, they use some of their funds to make projects to, to develop, uh, say, um, education in countries like uh, Madagascar or some other countries to, to avoid that young people could be attracted by this kind of activity. My third answer will be that we are just now working on, on creating this bridge between government, private sector, and NGOs. I just give you one example. Two weeks ago, with my Bulgarian colleague, we met the Commissioner Georgieva, the Commissioner Kristalina Georgieva, is responsible, is, is, she's Bulgarian, she's responsible in the European Union, in the, in the Commission, for, for emergency aid, uh, humanitarian aid. You know probably that the European Union is number one on the world with uh, some f big flood or uh, say what happened in Africa, in some country, Africa, in Somalia, for example, uh, uh, last year. And the European Union is the first donor, donor in, in, in case of emergency. And uh, we work together because the NGOs are, for example, when uh, the uh, tsunami, when the Fukushima uh, happened uh, in Japan this year, uh, there, was, uh, there was a cooperation between NGOs. NGOs send humanitarian aid, and they send it through uh, another air carrier, which is Lufthansa. Who, uh, so a private company would decide to give two flights free, free of charge, no, no payment, just to help Japan. Of course, then they can use this action to promote uh, their activities in Japan. And, 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 we will lie, and we decide with Commissioner Georgieva to create a bridge, exactly what you say, a platform between private sector, NGOs, and not government, but, but, but the European Union concerning humanitarian aid. I would like to touch on, you said that for the social integration in European Union, uh, like following the other lady for uh, the question of immigration, uh, no, there is some uh, new policy of the individual uh, member state of European Union that they are trying to, uh, for, for fr frankly, that they are uh, forbid for someone to wear the burqa in, in Europe. Yeah. Do you think whether this is uh, become also make influencing on the European Union, especially for the social committee when when they have the decision for this, uh, for individual state that have a certain uh, policy which is now being followed by the Belgian. And then, uh, do you think it will become the uh, European Union policy for this kind, regarding <coughs> that you have so many immigrants here and even the member of the other European states will also, some of them are wearing the uh, field. And then the second thing, uh, what do you think about the spread of the Islamic phobia in Europe when you said there must be a respect of human rights and a freedom of religion? Thank you. First of all, I, would, I consider myself that uh, uh, this is my French culture, my French identity. But the, religi but the religion is a, is, a private, is a private thing. And I, for that, I think we should respect all religion. And I don't see any difference. We have uh, European Muslims. We have country like uh, will probably one day join Europe, like uh, Bosnia Herzegovina, where you have not a majority but a large number of Muslims. Uh, Albania, Albania is uh, the, uh, the Albanian people are truly European. It's one of the oldest European nations, but they are Muslims. You see history, and I have no respect, and I have all respect, and I think I don't, I don't put one religion higher than the others. We have, of course, some, some roots in Europe, some, but each religion has its legitimacy and I have all respect. The second thing that you mentioned, uh, and, and this should be for, me, for, for my point of view, but this is probably my French culture, but the European Union should be neutral, should not, should not interfere in, in the religious sphere. Should be, we can have a discussion with them, but we should not interfere. Uh, what's concerning the burqa? This was a debate in France because you know that we have now a law. Uh, 
my personal personal view is that it's not a question of <coughs> sorry it's not a question of religion it's a question of of respect uh, and of consideration and, and of women's right uh, and uh, we had a large debate in France concerning the question of a burqa and there was quite a division in the society on that but the largest majority of all representatives including from the Muslim community, were in favor of a ban of a burqa because of women's right. And considering the wears of burqa in, in public life, but in the street, in, in administration, in schools, for example. Uh, and, and there, I, I don't, so I don't think that we can have a, a common, in the, in the next years, a common, and we don't want, I think, a common EU legislation on that. It was your, your question. Because there is too much difference in the treatment, in the, in the consideration of a society concerning this phenomenon. But, um, but in France, there, we have this uh, concept, uh, it's in our identity, of uh, this egalitarian concept. That means that we don't see, we don't want to see too much difference. We have also in our identity this, uh, what we call, I don't know the term in, in English, but lies. We consider that the state should be neutral to all religion. So people don't have to show too expressly their religious apartness, something private. Uh, and third, we have, a, like others, a long tradition of, of women's rights and fight against all kinds of way to un, to downgrade the women, so this conduct this has conduct to this to this law, which is most symbolic. I don't think there is very few cases, maybe two or three cases where some some person had been captured and they have to pay some something. But it's more it's more symbolic. But for the time, I think this kind of legislation should remain at national level, and I think we cannot. I don't want to see it to see it at, at the European Union because I think that it's, we have to build on a common policy on integration, on European identity, but concerning this special aspect, I think this will remain for a long time at national level. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to take this opportunity to ask you to please express our gratitude to Mr. Henri Malos. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Merci beaucoup.